Tonight, philosophical midwifery. New word, new expression, new idea, the pathologos. First, Socrates defines his art as philosophical midwifery. Picks up the name from his mother, that was her art, and he says, just as my mother gives assistance in helping those who are pregnant give birth, helping them with the travails, he said, so I too help in bringing to birth, but not children, but ideas. Therefore, he said, I have an art very similar in every respect to my mother's art. He said, I can bring on abortions. I can assist in the delivery. I can judge after whether it's a true and noble birth. I can offer a variety of services for those in need. Now, what is it he said? He said that we're all pregnant. All pregnant with ideas. The difficulty is twofold. One kind we in some way intuit, another kind we don't know we have and we don't know we're pregnant with and we don't know it's been a long time having them and they should have been delivered and they're still around causing undue stress and that's the whole problem of human existence. Now, Plato explores, see here we have luckily enough a figure of a person Therefore, there's an idea somewhere. I'm going to use that as the mind, though I don't believe it's in the brain. And we're pregnant. And we have to bring to birth. We don't know we're pregnant. And therefore, you need the assistance of a midwife who can identify that and help bring it to birth. And that's the great drama. That's the great drama. Get it out. I want to give you first an example of a pregnancy. Then I'm going to take you through all of these ideas. And therefore, let me first start with saying, first, a pathologos is a sick idea. It's a sick logos. It's a sick idea. It's a sick idea because it's a false belief about oneself and about the nature of reality. And we all have them. We all have them. Now, if I were to ask you to give me a list of all the different spiritual disciplines, I imagine you'd include yoga, breathing, meditation, fasting, the different religions, the list would be enormous. There's only one thing they all share. They all share in one thing. And that's what separates what we're going to be doing tonight from everything else. They all agree that the nature of man's difficulties cannot be resolved, solved by recourse to reason. There is no way in which man can understand himself through reason to resolve his problems. They all agree to that. Doesn't make any difference whether Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Jews, doesn't make any difference. The nature of man's problems are beyond reason because they see reason and the nature of the mind is to be too inadequate for the task of man's creative evolution. What we're going to look at is the alternative to this, philosophical tradition of the Platonic tradition. And therefore, Plato is going to start, as we are here tonight, we're going to say that it all begins, man's basic condition, his primary ignorance is the result of having picked up sick ideas, which we are calling pathologos. Ah, let me give you one now. Now, what's interesting about it is that you only pick them up when you are in dependent relationships. Dependent relationships. You can't get a new one 
once you're adult. You can't get a new one. No way you can get a new one. You can only get them as a child when you're in a dependent relationship. Has nothing to do, has nothing at all to do with corporeal punishment, has nothing to do in any way with any kind of violence, has nothing to do with any kind of learning that's brought about by any violence done to the child. It's brought about in an entirely different way. And that way is as creative as anything man has ever done. This whole in introduction, induction of the pathologus is extremely creative, and I'm going to try to see if I can make that clear this evening. So therefore, let me give you an example of one. All right. Here you can see here, here in my little sketch, is a couch. And here is the mother. And here is the daughter. And they're both watching TV. And that's how Pathologus was introduced. <laughs> really? Yes, really. Let's put in the conditions for it. If the mother, authority, has to be an authority, uses this moment to introduce a pathologos, then we can see in this simple scene all the dynamics of any trans transmission of a pathologos from parent to child. It doesn't have to be their child, but it does have to have a dependent relationship. Dependent relationship at this point means that their continued existence depends upon some party, some person. So let us create the same. First of all, it has to be unusual. It has to be an unusual exchange or interaction. It has to be unusual exchange of interaction, especially in one respect. No competition. All of the energy doing this, as the story unfolds, is going to be directed not just at the TV screen, but at the child. Let's see how it can develop. If the parent decides to be close and intimate with the child, warm, responsive, caring, if the child comes to that scene with an openness and a receptivity, and if these scenes are otherwise rare, if these scenes are otherwise rare, then the child is going to see this as a great opportunity for intimacy, openness, and love, and they're both going to enjoy the TV. Now let's create the conditions. Let us assume now that they're watching a particular kind of movie. All right. Let's say the particular dramas are always late 19th century dramas that are being featured. And in this case, let us assume that the particular films that are being shown are musicals depicting royal mounted police and other kinds of 19th century figures, and including light opera. Now, what are the conditions we have? The child enters into this open and receptive, looking forward to sharing an intimacy with the mother. The father isn't around. The other children aren't around. They are together. They're enjoying this. No violence, nothing. How can, an in, how can a sick idea, a pathologist, be introduced in such a obviously friendly, open, caring scene? Now, If the mother now shares confidences, ah, shares confidences, uses this opportunity to express what she really thinks about the nature of reality, about her world, 
and her daughter's world, then being open and receptive and warm and everything created for a mutuality. And then the mother turns to the child when it's over and says, you know what? They never make films like that anymore. And if this is an interesting theme that plays itself out in the house with the following ideas. All right, let me give some themes that were created from other scenes. Themes such as um, you are too old. Time has passed you by. The golden ages are past. The child then listening to this statement about the TV, why this is just another statement similar to these. It's another occasion when they're playing out these themes to their child. Now the child has to listen to the mother and has to believe her. Has to believe her. Because the mother at this point appears to be sincere, sharing, honest, honest integrity, an occasion for love, appears most rational, appears most rational, most knowing, Now the child is going to go away from this scene after the movie is over and they're going to make a judgment. Let's agree between you and I just for this evening that the films that they're watching and have been watching are in a series of uh, Jeanette McDonald and, and uh, Nelson, Nelson, what's his last name? Nelson Eddy. Yeah, Rosemary. Rosemary. All right, got the movies? All right. Shall I assume that we all know those and we can go a step further and you can also make a nice critical judgment about the kind of art that's being displayed in these movies as compared with contemporary artists and you can pick them all the way from, June, from Sutherland to Pavarotti or anyone else if you're liking. And now take a look at what the mother has said. The mother has said, they never make films like that anymore. The child now walks away and has a decision to make. Is that true? Well, of course it's true. Of course it's true. Wait a minute. Of course, of course it's true. Um, that means then that my mother saw them when they were new. She was caught up in the excitement of it when they first came out. She was born too late. The golden age is past. I'm living in the shadows of it. Well, I was born at the wrong time. It's the very nature then of what this person is going to perceive is that they are, that, that there's been a split in the nature of reality and the great times are over. They can't function. So the child then walks away and is going to come to a conclusion about this event. Now it's not the kind of a conclusion that is put into words. It's kind of a feeling conclusion. It's about an attitude. It's about a sense about the nature of reality. It's never discussed again. It's never, this is never discussed with mother. Hey mother, as an example, uh, 
Mom, they made a lot of films since those films back there in the 30s, 40s. Are you sure that there aren't any ends that are equal to it, that didn't have greater artistic merit? Can't. Because these themes have been playing out again and again. So therefore, this is another scene that takes place that builds a certain attitude and a certain view about themselves and their reality. Now look here. Pathologus is a false belief of the nature of the self and the nature of reality. It's learned but not taught. Because the child then comes to a conclusion from this scene and it's wordless. They don't go back and confirm it. It's not open for discussion. They may in fact forget it, but it's going to play itself out in their lives. What we're saying, therefore, is the fundamental beliefs about the nature of our reality and ourselves are picked up very casually, their most important fundamental notions, and from this very simple, simple kind of scene, which doesn't appear to be traumatic, it's not something that's going to register in the unconscious, but it's wordless and therefore it's not going to be able to be recalled. If it's not going to be able to re be recalled, it's not part of the recollection someone can have. Unless they're brought to see the need to bring up these kinds of past scenes. So then, let's see what happened. The mother in this case appeared as convincing as she could. They were sharing something. Within that sharing and that convivial relationship, they shared a confidence. The child had to be open and receptive. The mother then appeared sincere, sharing, had honesty, integrity, appeared like love. And if this is the time they're most rational, they appear like they're most knowing, to the degree that these things, to the degree that these most important things are only connected with these kinds of events, if they're only connected to these kind of events, that child is going to then pick up these attitudes, they're going to form fundamental beliefs about themselves and the nature of their reality. Well, so what? So it is. See if we can go the next step. No. We'll get to that. No. It looks like a child is actually born with an amazing attraction for those very things. Integrity, truth, sense of fairness, openness. That's what they're born with. Since these ideas can play themselves out when a child is even two years old. Because when all of those things are... <laughs> has always had problems when they say, well, children are naturally nice people. There is nothing as vicious as a child, really, when you aren't a normal person. Uh, a adult wouldn't put down another person, a child will. Uh, and that's not being taught by the parent. My own. Well, look, there is no attempt to try to make the child appear angelic. We're only talking about the fact that there's certain beliefs that are transmitted. A child is immature. A child will be able to act out their immaturity in a vile and a series of ways. And among those ways, there are going to be times when they are going to be unjust, etc. Oh, absolutely. We're just concerned with how they adapt, adopt certain fundamental beliefs. It's not, pre not presenting them as angelic in any way. It reminds me, my father was not real close to me. One of the few times he was level with me was he'd be telling me his happiest days as being a bachelor. And I've never married, so I might have had some See, <laughs> If you'd like, I could take that scene for you and show you. Like, how often did he relate to you that way? Well, just a certain time when I was really young, and right. we were 
patching, and my mother was sick, so he was. He had the problems. He had two children, had hospital bills to pay, mm -hmm. and probably burdening him. And so he laid. They say, "Well, my happiest days when I was a bachelor did not have all these problems." See, what I wanted to know is, when did he share confidences like that with you? It would be when we were we'd, uh, had supper together and we washed the dishes. Right, so then, you see, you're open, you're working together, very similar, say. You're open, you're working together, it looks like an ideal scene. There's no reason to be suspicious of any message coming down. That's right. Because he's always working, or, you know, he's a right. workaholic. So That's right. good times together. Yeah, yeah. So then he's taking this time to share something with you. How does he look at that moment? Knowing? Yeah. Sincere? Sure. Yeah, all of the key virtues. He's my soul authority. That's right. He's the soul authority. Look here. He looks great. Yeah. Right? He looks great. Yeah. We're here. He's sharing something with us. You entered into a relationship with him. He's sharing something with you. That's most important. And in that sharing, in that sharing, you're discovering something that he thinks is most true. That's right. And if he thinks it's most true and he's sharing that with you, that's a transmission of a dharma. And it's going to play a major role in your life. Uh, do you have any brothers or uh, sisters? Yeah, I have a younger sister. And is it she a, a single? No, she, was, she, was, she wasn't there at the time. She, she got married. No. She had no trauma getting married. You see, what would have been interesting, which no child can do, would Ben at that time to have said to Dad, Hey Dad, you say this to Sister too or just to me? Uh, aren't there anything, uh, are there uh, any good things in being married, Dad? Like you. <laughs> like you. Yeah. So, yeah, his own son's standing here. Right? So he's saying, I, my happiest days are back. What is he saying about you? He's saying that I'm not very well, I'm not much appreciated. I'm just a burden. Is what he's just saying. a burden? Yeah. So that's an image he's communicating to you. Yeah. That's the very same kind of view, you see. These attitudes are passed on that are going to play a role. Right inferiority complex most of my life. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, would you agree what's interesting, we haven't gotten to it, but let's bring it in now. These attitudes and beliefs create a role. That gives him a role, that gives you a role. Yeah. Two roles. And yours was to accept that is true, and if that's true, you have to be inferior. Sure. Why? Because I'm a burden on him. Because you're a burden on him. That's, that's, that's right. That's what I am. That's right. I have no, no integrity to the universe. <laughs> no integrity to the universe. These are how beliefs are passed on. Fundamental beliefs. My brain wasn't developed enough, so I could question it. Just ah, ah. Now, there's something else that occurs which is very important. Now. There's a word I'm going to use. Here it is. Beauty. When all of those qualities come together, they look their best. They look their best. They look noble, honorable. It's impossible to conceive of the fact that at that time, for their own reasons, they're saying something that is not true. That's impossible for us to believe. It was the most beautiful time. Most of the time he ignored me because he was busy doing other things. So there's a few times... This, this is very important. Close to him, yeah. That's right. This is very important. And he thought enough of you to share a secret. Yeah. And so you're going to consider it. <laughs> See, he made the appearance believable. Yeah. Because he looked believable. She became believable. Yeah. Right. They become believable. And it can never take place if the scene wasn't prepared. You have to be open. There has to be sincerity. There has to be the sense of care and love. And that brings on the great role of the knower. This is a very important thing. In our society, there are very little times, very few times, when we can ever play the knower role. Very few times when we can really have an audience that's open and receptive to us, who will listen, who will be attentive, who will even believe it. But in the family, that's where you can do it. Yeah. And therefore, this is an ideal time for the person to play the great knower role. Mm -hmm. That's the time. And therefore, it's a great moment, very significant. 
Now, what's most interesting about this is that the individual who's playing out this doesn't even know what they're doing. Just unloading He's unloading at the time. Yeah. They're unloading at the time. If you went back and said, hey, Dad, you know, some of the most significant things in my life, there are about 10 of them. And, you know, one of them happens to be the time when we were doing dishes together. Do you think he'd remember doing dishes with you and giving that message? <laughs> no. Right? It it's, looms large on our horizon. That's a great event because something was passed on to us. But for them, they don't even remember it. But we recall it, it frames, see? Now we pick on what you, let's call it a mask. We become what appears to be consistent with that message, with that transmission of the doctrine. And therefore now we carry it. Now, you see, what maintains it? This is how it's transmitted, but how is it maintained? How is the teaching maintained? Because it's maintained for the whole life. It's maintained in a very interesting way. If anybody who was working and exploring their pathologos, these basic beliefs, all you need to do is discover just two interesting things. You take the themes, and there are only a finite number of them, <coughs> like here, the one you just gave us, which is the, kind of gave you the belief in inferior, inferiority role, or inferiority view of yourself, then you want to see how the daydreams a person has, their fantasies, daydreams, and night dreams, interrelate. <clears throat> they always interrelate. Dreams, though we may not have enough time tonight to go through it, the nighttime dreams will always contradict the daydreams. The daydreams are always fragments, fragments of these pathologos scenes and the struggle against it. They always work. Night dreams contradict it and offer a solution out if we know how to read them and engage them. So we create them, we conclude, we live them. How do we live them and what maintains them? Daydreams. That's what maintains them. It's the daydreams that is continually playing the record over and over again. That's the conditioning aspect of the human psyche. If you want to bring about a change in yourself or anyone else, right, you have to be receptive to your daydreams and you have to ask when they occur. Look here, when they occur. <clears throat> Precisely, they're a moment of intrusion. And you'll see something interesting. Like at this time, all right? Now, <clears throat> let's take this scene and the one that came before it. Do you think in both of the cases, the one you just gave us, the one we had before, pardon me, the one we had before, that it would inhibit someone's desires to try to go out and achieve something significant? Clearly in your case. It did. That, right, it did, yeah. see? Let's try the other one. How do you think that first case I had on the board might equally prevent, inhibit success in something significant and meaningful? Well, I found out that I always felt that other people were having all the fun. I was never having any fun with those the other people. But when I found out I went out was a day tell about all the fun they had and I realized I'd be buying into a situation which wasn't true. I was having just as much fun as everybody else. I just bought into the You bought into the view that Yeah, that I was having That's fun. right. <laughs> right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Or you couldn't admit to yourself, given this teaching. Yeah. Because otherwise that would be a rather curious doctrine. Let's see if we can make sense of it in a moment. Yes. If they don't make movies like that anymore, why would I want to make a movie? Because it's guaranteed not to be a movie like that. Greatness was always something in the past. Yeah, it's in the past already, and 
and it's sealed, isn't it? It's sealed, and why should I bother uh, trying? Since uh, it's already been done. It's already yeah, been I don't done. Make movies like that. That's it's right. To that too. <laughs> Therefore, when someone who might have that background is really trying to do something significant, it has to be something personally significant. It can't be just practical. Right? And the more ideal it is, the more this will come into existence. See, to challenge this, to challenge this, brings it up. Let me try it again. Okay. When the young, sorry, so when this person then sitting with the mother, let's call her a boy or girl, let's call her a girl. All right. Okay. Now, when this girl now grows up and she wants to achieve something, she has some significant goal, and it's important for her to achieve it, if the person, if this young lady's mind then works on this theme, then she's going to have to be able to reconcile two things. One, greatness is only in the past. That's what mother said. Hey, I want to achieve something meaningful and significant. If I achieve something meaningful and significant and then bring it back to my mother, she's going to have to make a judgment about her basic and fundamental belief, isn't she? Mm -hmm. She's wrong. A way to avoid that. Don't do it. Do it half. Leave something out. Don't, it, don't succeed. Only give the appearance of success. And that's as much as you can have then it's consistent. If it's consistent, we can live with it. Very simple belief. Look at that. Sitting, watching TV, two people sitting. Looks like anyone who took a film of it would say that's a very fine, wonderful scene. If they took a sip film of your, your father and you doing dishes together, in the kitchen working together, a nice, nice convivial relationship, sharing a confidence, who could ever think that would be the basis for any kind of Pathologo, sick idea. We all know too many examples of brothers and uh, sisters, and mm -hmm. some become a roaring success, and some mm -hmm. become nobodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also all know examples of people which we really think are very nice people who have children that are completely screwed up. Yes. And we all know yes. people who yes. think are screwed up who have yes. very nice children. Yes. So that's true. Uh, that's right. I don't think there's a particular pattern. That's of course I can understand that. Of course you don't. Yeah. See my sister was never around at any this time because she was staying with my aunt knuckle these times. So oh, oh. She, didn't, she, she didn't get this teaching. She got a different one. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. even if it's the same teaching, they don't turn out the same. Watch. I'm going to go further with you, okay? Watch now, okay? You see, if someone is successful in the arena in which they're in, then they have to have greater goals for this game to show itself. This is, a much, this is what we call the noblest game. Now, if a person is eminently successful in business and art, now if they want to take a look at their real fundamental beliefs, they need a more mature goal. And this is where it becomes most interesting, enlightenment. They need the goal of enlightenment. They need the goal of achieving wisdom. They now have to have transcendental goals because that's the only thing then that's going to bring up the most basic and fundamental beliefs. When people sit, when people are in intense concentration, when people are in contemplative states and they're struggling to break through, what they're struggling to break through are these feeling states that we've described here. And anyone who has broken through into this state Anyone who's broken through into this state, if you talk to them and if they're, open, if they're open to such discussions, the most interesting discussion would take this form. May I put a couple too? Sure. If you're such a person, we would say, Could, now look here, is it likely that you had such a breakthrough? Yes. yes. Good. 
What we're interested in is not so much you're describing the breakthrough. We're interested in knowing whether you could talk about in as much detail as you can, maybe the three minutes before it took place. What happened? I don't know, just uh, something opened up. Something opened up. See, so for something to open up, that's right, something opened up. We're interested in knowing what was the key? What was it that opened up? What was the condition for the opening up? Because you had to give something up to open up. You have to give something up to open up. That's right. I found out when I started practicing Zen, I had a lot of knowledge that was Unnecessary. I had to give up an awful lot. You had to give up your knowing role. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you had to give up your knowing role, we, we would be very interested in knowing whether that knowing role had anything to do with appearing like someone we know. Yeah. Did it? Yeah. Then you gave up this as an idol, right. as an ideal. Right. Then you could open up to this higher experience. Right. That's right. That's the way it plays itself out. And until you do, it binds you. So you found a way to bring... Now the difficulty with all enlightenment games, however, is that there is often a way to have how to integrate it. And unless you discover what it was, part of it can still retain its, its force. Mm -hmm. Because part of what we're talking about has a counterattack. Right? Now, see, these, are, these problems that occur, occur in cycles and they link themselves up with others of a like kind. And they produce, they're also capable of producing, producing problems of a similar nature, so it's monadic. But apart from that, there's a great power to these pathologos. It has a powerful counterattack. It has a device, part of its being is to protect itself and maintain itself. And therefore, you see, after you come through with one of these enlightenment experiences, unless you go back and see what it was you dropped, as you were very, very perceptive in seeing, that it meant giving up your knower, the knowing game. All right? I am assuming that we're together when you say that the knowing game you gave up has some kinship in appearance and in matter to that of your father. Never thought of that. Possible. Oh, so that's why is it sitting down and talking not about the enlightenment experience, but what you had to drop to open up helps you stay and open. Mm -hmm. Because to the degree that you don't see that, what it is that you dropped, it's still there to some degree. Modest, more modified, but it will still play itself out. So, let me ask you, okay? There you were, all right? There you were, all right? Now notice you have this <sighs> concentration is building up, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're focusing on whatever your practice is, and you're against a wall. Mm -hmm. And you know there is an issue at stake and you don't know what it is. Right. But you drop it all, and what you dropped was the knower game. Right. Now, if anybody could have described your knower game, how would they describe it before you dropped it? When would it be most visible? If, if we got some of the people who knew you and said, say, uh, uh, when was his knower game most visible? What would you say? Oh, well, I suppose it's uh, in 1972 when we had my biggest All right. And before that, uh, if someone were to ask you to describe that knower game that you knew, how would they describe it or how would you describe it?
Well, I just suppose that I was just a very, I was uh, hard working. Hard working? Yeah. Dedicated to work? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I was uh, dedicated to work for its, for its own sake, I guess. Was for a its virtue, own sake. Just a virtue, working, yeah. Working hard. Mm-hmm. And um, um, so I was uh, just giving my full attention to, uh, mm-hmm. to working to make a living. Mm-hmm. Practicing Zen and practicing Sufism mm-hmm. my whole life. Matter of fact, you practice Zen the same way you practice work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after this experience, how did you practice Zen? Did, did it, it change? What? Yeah, well, it, uh, I found out that uh, gradually I wasn't able to, uh, to concentrate anymore. Hmm. My mind opened up. And I wanted to, uh, after that, I just wanted to laugh and dance and sing and, and, and the solo. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. And? Well, my whole life changed. Right. And, uh, and then I found out that I was in a state. Mm-hmm. Automatically, I didn't have to sit yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how would Dad have looked upon these three things? Pardon? How would your father have looked upon those oh, three he things? He been very, uh, he wouldn't have approved at mm. all. So when you drop that knowing game, remember all of those terms you used, certainly looked like they described your dad's total vocation and duty towards yeah. business, right? You dropped his, uh, his... I dropped being serious. Whatever he gave you in this transmission, you dropped. Right. dropped the whole bag. You dropped the whole bag. I didn't mind being foolish anymore. That's right. Or being ignorant. Or being ignorant. Or stupid. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. And so, let's say, then laughing, dancing, and singing, and I was open to. It wouldn't have been had that knowing game stayed in place. When you therefore opened up, you first had to drop that. Yeah. Yeah. I notice there's nothing major about that scene. It's just two people washing dishes together, passing a piece of information. Happens every day. That's why in the same house, children can have total different destinies because these casual transmissions go on all the time in different ways, and the person who's doing it may not even be aware of it. Or if they are aware of it, they're not aware of the consequences no. that follow from such what an event. More powerful was it usually is very busy, and so he didn't have much time to mm-hmm. spend. Mm-hmm. So every time he spent, he was very bad at it. Mm-hmm. In my mind. Yeah. 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 Uh, people have always told me and have asked a lot yeah. of friends that. They, when their children become adult, that the child and the adult are really the same people, that their children really don't change that much. That's right. Uh, it, the personality is there when they're a child. Uh, in this case, we just saw one where that father's remarks molded the child. Know, even before that, it is there. Yes. Um, it is there. I totally, uh, I totally agree with you. Because, you see, we call that the milieu, right? We call that the milieu. Right? And that means that, you see, you were aware of your father's manners long before this, yeah. all the way back when you were an infant. Yeah. The question then is, how did this particular event put that coping stone right in there? Yeah. That's the issue. Go ahead. My used to tell me that when I was a baby, mm-hmm. in the crib, I had the milk bottle and I played with it. And they were worried because I didn't seem to care whether I drank the milk or not. I just loved to play with the milk bottle. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they were very worried about me whether I grow up to be a healthy person now. See, that's the story. Could it be that you might have also walked away wondering whether or not he's making a point about the fact that you were playing freely? and enjoying yourself. Is that also in the message? 
Is that also in the message that you could walk away with? See? Because when we walk away, we conclude, and we don't put that, those conclusions in words or share them until reflection brings them back. Right, he told you that story more than once, you see? Now, what do you think about the twist I put on it? Very good. Right? Very appropriate. So, you see, he could be making those statements the whole life, and therefore, the grandparent is like the parent as the parent is to the child, because this transmission is going down through generations. Now, you see, if you have those, those scenes where your father is telling you about that, now we've got to go back to this one. There you are doing dishes. What additional piece of information comes in at that point which is so significant? Because this is the heart of it. It's, so it's shaping it all along so that all the children Right, become very much like their parents. That's right, there's that filial bond. That's right. But what do these particular events do? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to be more like my father because I wanted to be accepted by him because he was my sole emotional, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. basically sole emotional support. With my father and my mother, it was sick and she wasn't around him. Yeah, let me see if I can help you with one thought. See whether we can push this further, all right? He's building over the years an image of work, dedication to work. Yeah. He's also at the same time making certain statements which like we just explored a moment ago, against that is a certain worry when you're playing, mm -hmm. open, spontaneous. Mm -hmm. He doesn't attack those things directly. No. He said, I was worried when you were playing with your bottle that you may not get enough nourishment. So, I mean, who can say anything about the fact that your father is showing very much that he cares? Right. Ah, wait a minute. Behind it, we suspect there's another message. That's the wordless one. See, that's the one we carry. Now, now you are, there you are with him. You're doing the dishes, and he passes out this very innocent appearing remark. What does that tell you in addition? What does that tell you? Keep Try it. Most of grindstone. Pardon me? I keep my nose to grindstone and not be frivolous and not enjoy myself. But he put in another one. Don't get married. Don't get married, right. But if you get married, that takes away from work. See, that added, didn't it? It also that, takes away from enjoying my life because I did follow down like he was. That's right. right. That's right. So therefore you have a negative, had a negative view about that whole activity in life. Because you already, see, through the milieu, had built up the idea of work and the fact that one should avoid the spontaneity and playing because that detracts from work. Right, that went along until this particular event came in when he gives you that great statement. <laughs> You know, my happiest days were when I was a bachelor. Well, then that means the happiest days is when he was working, not married. Ah, clever. Now he's giving you that. You love him, he's your authority. Right, undoubtedly he was fair towards you. Right, had many virtues. We're not taking any of that away from him. What we're interested in is how a belief is formed and the impact it has on the particular person. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I still feel uh, circumstances there uh, that you probably never met a um, girl you were crazy about. Well, I did meet one or two. And? Mm -hmm. and what happened? Uh, I, I, I just, I've uh, known too many people who mm -hmm. get into marriages that they know they shouldn't get into. <laughs> They get into yeah. because they are crazy about the person. Yeah, and and they usually look very much like one of their parents. Yeah, go ahead. No. no. Well, then, let me just see for a moment. Yeah. Well, I did meet a girl in, in college, and uh, we seemed to almost connect. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, I didn't. After I met her, I didn't care about any other woman. I just enjoyed being with her. But she was a very sexy woman, mm -hmm. and she didn't mind. Uh, displaying it. I mean, mm -hmm. she was very open. It's completely 
I could never bring her to see my dad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, because? She's very playful. And, uh, a very playful? Yeah. Very so spontaneous? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. And uh, I was afraid it wouldn't approve. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now she incorporated within herself the very virtues that he's denying. So even though you may have loved her, yeah. it meant you had to make a confrontation with her and him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So you see, What's interesting is that we then are attracted to the very things that we know are worthwhile. Find a woman who acts in that way. We're drawn towards them. We know the value of it. We can't reconcile, however, them with the teaching, and that creates a crisis. Now, um, see what's interesting about these events and the nature of the crisis is that the rarer the event, the rarer this transmission scene doing the dishes, the rarer those times are, the, most, the greater the impact they have. That's a key. Because then we're going to cling to them as symbolic of the entire relationship. And we're going to say, I can understand now. See, one of the interesting things about the pathologos is that it makes sense of the whole past, the milieu. Yeah. Milieu is that background of events that's in our home. Because, like, now you know something about Dad. He told you something confided. And that now makes sense of a lot of things that he's been doing. It makes sense. It makes everything rational. Based upon a false premise, it makes everything rational. And therefore, you can then pick up a role, and you can then relate to him, and it looks harmonious. I was thinking that it, it's like you can pick up the role without any criticism. No criticism. That's right. Because... It's the only time you can pick up a role, be close to them without criticism. That's right. No, because... You're right. Because... Because there isn't any criticism. Because that's what they want you to be. Oh, because that's what they want you to be. Oh. You're sharing in that moment. Mm -hmm. See, when you share in a belief, you participate in a belief under such circumstances, the role goes along with it, attitudes go along with it, and then it's allowed. Yeah, so and no criticism. That's absolutely right. Result, they're saying that's okay to be that way. That's the way to be. Yeah. That's the way to be. Then it's harmonious. That's the way to be. Now it admits of a certain minus and plus, depending upon the other factors. Right? Admits of a certain pound, but that's the dynamic. And. Uh, um, the, the, uh, see, each one of these, we said before, comes up in cycles, right? and they come up in cycles whenever we're in situations that have some similarity to this early scene. We're going to call this early scene the transmission scene. That's the name we're giving it, all right? The transmission scene. Who? Jerry? Jerry Quarry. He was a white prize fighter who, no. who uh, fought for the heavyweight championship. I see. And he is now what you call punch 
Oh, yes. Yes, dementia. They define him as a dementia case, yeah. And he's uh, 50, he's been taken care of by his older brother. Mm -hmm. And the article was about the fact, and there also was a younger brother who is also punched around. Uh, the father wanted his sons to be fighters. And he humiliated them mm -hmm. with the older brother, the oldest, who didn't mm -hmm. want to fight. His father would make him put on um, diapers to humiliate him, but mm -hmm. he didn't want to be a fighter. Mm -hmm. So he didn't become a fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Jerry Quarry became a fighter and a successful one, but he was in the ring too long and is now basically yeah, Crazy yeah. insane. Yes. But here you have the fact where the older brother completely rejecting what his father wanted, although his father humiliated him, and he still wouldn't yeah. do it. You're, you're quite right. What, yeah, you're quite right. And therefore, you want to know how is it in the same family there can be different destinies for different children. All right. Now there's another thing that's important too, and that is we have to consider all the players in the clan. Have to consider all the players in the clan. We don't know in that case the role of the mother. We don't know the role of the uncle. Anyone who played a significant role in the family, we would like to see how they contributed to that. You see, if he was wearing diapers, humiliated in that way, and the mother came in and let him know, let the son know, that she thought what he was doing was right, even though he's being humiliated, the humiliation is not going to have any effect. So you have to find so out. He just didn't want to be a fighter. Yes, I understand that. He just didn't well, want to be a fighter. Yes, wouldn't it be interesting also, since he just didn't want to be a fighter, <coughs> if that view also came from his mother or some other relative? <coughs> that that hey, you don't have to be, and if it's told to him in such genuine terms, then he won't have to be a fighter, and he'll put up with any kind of humiliation. Well, he was pointing not to be out in the article that his father pushing him and his two brothers, and with Jerry Quarry, mm -hmm. kept on fighting, although it was apparent damage mm -hmm. was being done, but... Yeah. <clears throat> See, the thing that you and I would like to know is, how did that other son, the older son, how did he maintain a relationship with that whole family during all of these years? What well, role did he play? He See, what role did he play? Pardon me? He takes care of his brother. No, I mean before. Him, before. Him, yeah. Him. See, <clears throat> See, he had to have been with the family as a rebel, and allowed and tolerated for all of that length of time. And we'd have to know why and how. Sure. And it would be an un the unfoldment of that story would be very important. Uh, the article said that he doesn't speak to his father. <laughs> That's great. Because his father That's right. won't admit what he had Yeah, That's right. Married. That's right. So he never spoke to him. He had some other way of relating emotionally, and I'll, I'll be risking an opinion and saying it had to be someone else. Sure. The mother can be pretty strong, too. Yeah. Well, I still must say that I respect the older brother that he took charge of Jerry and is basically taking yeah. care of him, yeah. uh, but shaving him, and yeah. dressing him, and feeding him. It, it, and it would be interesting to me as a, someone who's involved in these kinds of, of uh, I don't like calling them cases, but I would like to know whether or not the mother took care of that older son in all the ways in which later the older son is taking care of the younger son. What she's telling us is that the older son took on the nurturing role, yes. the mothering role for the yeah. younger boy. Yeah. So he must have been very much influenced by the mother. He must have taken on that role. Or someone in the family encouraged him. You know, it's, it looks like the mother, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and it would be worthwhile finding out. Yeah. Um, I've always been told, like in third world countries, how come they have so many children? Uh, it's a form of uh, social security that 
you figure with 10 children, there at least is going to be one child that is going to feel the responsibility that they have to take care of the parents. Yes. And so yes. there's a better chance of, yes. of, of that. Yes. And it does appear with families I know they're always, there are children who do take on that responsibility with their parents and there are children who just don't. Yeah, see, you know, I, you know, see I am, look, see, this is not a way of trying to account for human beings' behavior. It's a way of trying to account for a specific kind of behavior that causes difficulties for people. The point that you're raising is how do you account for someone who turns out to have such high humanitarian ideals? This isn't going to tell you because they had to get through something to be that ideal. And that would be worth discovering. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Uh, I you, totally agree. With you. If you still have no. two two days um, times, it's in the I will make sure. I, sports yeah. page. Yeah. And it, it's part of a lengthy article, by the way, mm -hmm. that most of the prize fighters who seem to d die mm -hmm. in the ring seem mm -hmm. to be managed by their uh, father. Yes, recently. <laughs> Just to, to help you with that, there was a story within just a couple of months, now that I, I uh, recollect it, of, of mothers who have that same kind of, of dedication or f enforcing or coercion for their daughters to become ice skaters, figure skaters. And if you've ever gone to an ice skating rink, you can see the mothers lined up and you can see how they give their love and affection and attention only when the child does it well. And when they don't, they ignore them. If the child is making the connection, and that's when my mother loves me and shows me respect, they're going to play it out that way. But they're going to get a crisis because sooner or later they have to do it for themselves. And that's the, one of the explanations of burnout. Hey, Mr. Gypsy Rose Lee, I had a whole story about her and her mother. Her mother's a dominating force. Mm -hmm. in her life. Her mother more or less pushed her into the... Now, yeah, see, what's interesting about this is that these are situations where the child is not pushed into anything. It's more subtle. See, it's a very subtle, very subtle yeah. process, and that's what makes it interesting. Because we can understand coercion, but we always know that only reaches a certain point and there's often a rebellion. Which is preached That's by right. our government. Did That's right. This is family values. They, they'd love to see this kind of uh, scenario going down in most families on the surface. On the surface. It appears. You could film this. Life. You could film all of these scenes. This scene that we mentioned before with the girl you're seeing. It looks like an ideal family. Father doing the dishes with the son. Fine. Mother and daughter watching a movie flick eating popcorn, wherever it is they might. Yeah. But we're saying, watch how the introduction of basic beliefs about oneself and the nature of reality are brought in, and watch the effect it has. Because we were going somewhere before, we were saying, you see, by making this interesting statement, which is very famous, under similar circumstances, we can expect similar results. Therefore, when, when, uh, it's that point, let us say now, where you have to decide that you're interested in trying to achieve something and you have this teaching. As you get close to that open state that was similar, that was similar to the moment of that transmission, when you get in a state where you're similar to that open state, then that teaching is going to emerge and you're not going to allow, you're not going to be allowed to go any further unless you find some way of dropping it. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, see, which, what's great about all meditation and all spiritual exercises is that it builds up jariki, it builds up the power of concentration. It builds up, it fortifies you to make the jump. And that's its great value. And that's why it's so significant. Yeah. 
later on, I took I was studying voice, and I was kind of up for or up for uh, consideration for getting a scholarship. Mm -hmm. I went down. I forgot the forgot the words. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> so I goofed it up. So I, just, I uh, fulfilled that. Uh, well, it's because at that moment, to have been successful at that moment meant you had to confront that teaching. Yeah. And you have to confront that teaching to succeed on some higher level. Yeah. The higher the level, the more you have to face it. Which is why uh, very often in the religious tradition, uh, people who do achieve very profound states of mind, if they don't integrate what it is, they fall. They have all kinds of crises and they get in all kinds of problems. Not because they haven't achieved great spiritual heights, but they haven't integrated what it is they dropped. And therefore it comes back in an older form and they have to then deal with it. They can't deal with it. They're no longer in that high state of concentration. Therefore they succumb to the follies that will be, beset them. And I'm sure you know a good number of, of people who fit that description. Because this is the role of understanding. This is the role of understanding. And remember the way we started. We said, this is the role of understanding. It's a certain interesting way in which you have to confront yourself and what you've learned. And when you do that, it's an opportunity for quantum jumps in development. But it's very difficult, independent of any additional Jariki concentration. It's very much more difficult. Sir? And this is what you meant earlier when you said in contrast with all the other systems. That's right. And they believe that these problems cannot be solved by reason. That's right. And this one is saying uh, without the reason uh, where you can solve Yeah, but I'm also, I'm also going a step further and saying, however, I know that there are some states of mind that are so profound that it can literally break through all beliefs. But that's the, uh, <coughs> what's called Maha Samadhi, that, that's the uh, most profound states that break through every basic belief, all preconceived beliefs. And this is the great story of people like Basui, uh, who achieved that kind of enlightenment. Very rare, very great, very powerful, very penetrating. Vast consequences, permeates everything, yeah. You know, total transformation of personality. Yeah, I also bought into the idea that my father used to tell me that uh, all my talents were artistic. He said, don't be an artist, don't be a behemoth, you never know where your next meal is coming from. Be an accountant like I am. You never have to worry about your meals or anything. So I bought into that, and I had no, no talents for being an accountant or for business at all. But I tried to be successful mm -hmm. in an area mm -hmm. that I had no expertise in. And I ignored the area which I had expertise in. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happened. That's what that's it. I said, first of all, I'm going to be a success in what he wants me to be. Then I'll be a success in what I want to be. So, <laughs> I'll keep both. I'll keep both worlds. Yeah. That's the great dream. Yeah. <laughs> uh-uh. Because is that what's most important about all of this is that these pathologos, as you can see, are irreconcilable with your highest goals. Because the pathologos is a deceptive view of the self and reality. And therefore it has to be irreconcilable to the highest goals. Because to reach the highest goals, especially the most meaningful goals, which is the whole quest of enlightenment, so there are some people, perhaps you know some, who would be willing to go on and achieve all kinds of success, but they know they really have one area they want to get into, and that's to know themselves. Yeah. That's what I did. For pretty soon it became the only important thing was to find out what the ultimate reality was, and yeah. everything became right. unimportant. Right. And you also know some people who know that that's important, but then pour all their energies into the practical world, they become successful and their life is a failure. Yeah. Because that's not success. That really doesn't test these basic ideas. Okay. And the only real development is when we... We bought into the wrong idea for the success. Yeah, well, that's right. So this plays, you see, you can... Uh, it's like this, see. 
as your success, your vision of success increases in profundity, so whatever is comparable to these beliefs emerges and manifests itself. And therefore, to go the next step, that's what you have to give up. That's what you have to see through. That's what you have to drop. And that's the opening up into the next step. So theoretically, if it were possible to find some way to be able to identify all of the basic pathologos a person has, both about themselves and the nature of reality, then you could match them and say, okay, now these are the studies you're going to have to go through. So why is it the most interesting thing? By heavens, I think it's the most profound thing I know of. And that is that you... You, what this says is that unless you have a, a true view of the self and the nature of reality, you're going to suffer. It's in the very heart of reality that if you don't have a view of the nature of the self, any view of the self that is less than its total reality is going to give you a problem. Conc of course, these are the same, self and reality. Because if you have a negative view of the self, you have a negative view of reality, you have a negative view of reality, you have a negative view of yourself. So I aspire to be, to realize that state where I was completely free of all beliefs, mm -hmm. all, all conditions, mm -hmm. unconditional. Unconditional. Open. Right. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't get sidetracked with any conditions. No. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And the only problem, remember, is that occasionally, right, there are going to be parts that are still hanging around, right. and those are the things that you know you have to work on. Right. Yeah, that's right. And they'll always go back to a teaching. Yeah. Pardon me, a learning. A teaching right. is when you're literally taught yeah. something. These are learnings. Yeah. And as learnings, you don't forget them, but they're continued. And it's a, it's a formative principle in the development of the human psyche. Now, notice, in this whole thing, right, we've skipped a couple of things, of course. Uh, we touched on blame and anger. Man is angry. Mankind, we are angry because wherever we got these views, depreciatory views of ourself or the nature of reality, causes our anger. Everyone is anger. Yes. Everyone fundamentally is angry. Uh, anger. Has to have that yeah, anger. So Right. So then I realized I had to go beyond and get to the source of why I was angry. That's right. And that got me into the spiritual thing. That's how I realized there's no other. No other way. No other way. Well, you're very fortunate in being able to make that jump. Yeah. yeah, look, look, see. Now, see, it's not a blame game because they didn't know they were doing it. They didn't know the consequences of what they were doing. It's part of the milieu, part of the way they were relating. Right. It can be not only parents, but any authorities. It's not just a parental thing. Right. And therefore, there isn't any problem of blame. It plays itself out in the inner dialogues, daydreams. But this is not where I want to go, testing. All of the theoretical work you do in trying to understand yourself, we can map it out, we can map out the difficulties the person has, trace it back to these early scenes. Let's do one, all right? Here a person is trying to achieve something, they set themselves a significant goal. They find the fact that they create the scene where they can then function most ideally. They have everything they need to work and then they put it off they find other things to do and so destroy the goal they set. Right. Now, we can get a description of this in great detail. The thing we would ideally like to see is that moment when they perhaps got into it even a little bit, or even if they didn't, but even a little bit would be worthwhile, to see it precisely that moment when they quit to know what was going on in their mind and how they felt. That state of mind that they're in is the key to a past learning scene, such as the one you mentioned, right? And then, see, you can map it out, you can talk about it, you can see how your father looked, there you were doing dishes together, right? Here he's confiding into you into something. It can have many particular scenes like the unfoldment of a play, 
or a drama. That's called understanding. That won't get you out. That won't get you out. It'll give you insights. It'll be very interesting. You'll enjoy it. But you now have to go back to the thing that is undone, the most important thing, whatever the most important thing is for you, and the more significant it is, the more important, the more significant it is, the more, the, the, the better, what we're now going to call the testing. Because now you have to go back to the thing, the particular goal you had, or something far more significant, and try it out and see whether your understanding allows you an avenue to go through and it no longer blocks you. That's testing. That's determining the truth of these dialogues and these ways of exploring. That, see, it's not, this is theoretical. It's all good, very important. But then to find yourself then when you're now willing to go to the thing that you've avoided or haven't been able to achieve, set up the situation where it's most ideally, know all of this is going on, know that you've talked about this, you've understood it to a certain level, now you put yourself into it, and now you can watch what state of mind comes up. It may come up, but you know what? You may be able to go right through it and continue your work. Then all it is is a thought, a couple of thoughts, the remnants of a past state of mind. Or better yet, you remember there's something you used to do, but now you don't, and you don't remember that, and suddenly you discover that, oh yes. That's what I used to do. <laughs> That's very good. That's right. Then the memory is even there. It's an old one. It's an old act. Yeah. Well, we can drain out the anger. We can tell the memory without it making the same thing. That's right. Yeah. And that's the testing. So that's what's most important is the testing, to go back and test it again. What does this do? This allows a new kind of understanding to emerge. And that's what we call the logos real understanding, real reason. And it's a very significant thing, you see. It's the Logos. Now, Logos is connected with inner dialogues or daydreams and dreams in the same way, in exactly the same way. Let us try one, all right? We can use this, notice, we can use the same diagrams. A daydream has a beginning Remember, we want to know when it occurs, when it occurs, what state of mind the person was in that, that allowed that, that allowed that. You then want to write it down. You want to write it down in detail. You want the whole story. You want to let it run itself out. And you put it aside. And you wait for the occasion again to come up. And you do it again. And you suddenly discover that there are only a finite number of daydreams you have. And the drama tends to be repeated again and again and again. And it deals with some conflict. And what you're going to do then is to pick out in the daydream where the conflict is most visible or the success, either one, both will take both. And what you're going to do is just talk about having experienced that state of mind in your past. All that's all you're going to do. You're going to link it. It's a linking process. So, let's try it. Now let's get one, all right? <clears throat> Wouldn't it be interesting at this point if you had kept records before 1972 of your daydreams? Yeah. In detail. Right. And then to see why after 1972 they've changed. They have to change. Mm -hmm. They have to change. The degree to which they change is the degree to which one, is, one has dropped those images because every daydream has in it a mask an image of oneself. 
That image of the self is a reflection of the pathologos. And that's why they are so important to study. So therefore, if you can spot that, that moment in the daydream that was most intense, you identify the kind of state of mind you're in in the daydream, state of mind you're in the daydream, what we're going to call the mask. You ask, what, is, what has linked, what can I link that with in my past? I, yesterday, last week, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, wherever you want to go. So therefore you want to get then recollections of that state of mind, recollections of that state of mind. The recollections are themselves going to be stories, events that happened to you, things that you heard, saw, re were told, and you treat them exactly like the pathologos. Same thing. I had a dream, uh, I don't remember exactly when it was, but sometime previous to this, it was something to the probably in, in the 60s, it was in the 60s, and I had mm -hmm. a dream, mm -hmm. and I took this dream to a lady that was an authority on dreams, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she said, my dream was predicting my future enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So that was good girl. Yeah, talented woman. Yeah, I like to hear. Yeah, I'd like to hear stories of that. Is she still around? I don't know. She yeah. wrote a book about dreams. Oh, okay. But I don't remember if I have the book around. But she was a student of Edward Casey. Is she a Jungian or with Edward Casey? Is that? Well, she was much into Edward Casey. I don't know. About yeah, the Edgar dreams. Casey. Yeah. So yeah. Why they're compatible in many ways. Yeah. Okay. Basically, dealing on the other case that. Yeah, yeah. Sir? It sounds like the dream was contradicting the daydream. That's right. Dreams contradict the daydreams. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm still not clear on that. Could you give an example? Sure. Of the d dream and the daydream? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, when I think of daydreams, to me that's like the fantasy, it's yes. horrible yes. fantasy. That yes. I, like an example, that I won the lotto. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of dream would I have that would contradict that and so what? I mean, I daydream, you won the lotto. Okay. Um, in the daydream, the, 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 were there certain consequences of that then? Well, I've never. Uh, well, in the daydream. I'm just, uh, tossing that out. Oh, well, you see, what, two things. All right. uh, to have that dray, daydream. Everyone has that actually, I think. <laughs> well, that's why, that's why a lot of people play the lotto. Yeah. But not everybody does. Yeah, yeah, true. But. Uh, See, what does that mean the person is now willing to do? What are those things? How will they then appear with those things? Well, and why can't they do them right now? Yes, that's why where it's going to go. Why can't they believe the lotto? Yeah. Well, the joke is, I, I remember being told a person saying that they always pray to God that they can win the lotto. And then they were in the lotto, and then someone asked, Have you purchased a lotto ticket ever? And the person says, No, you don't. <laughs> yes, you can get it. Yeah. yeah you, you see, but if someone really had the daydream of the lotto, then they would likely think of themselves in a certain way, doing a certain number of things. The money they think will allow them to do the certain things. They think that, however, that that will allow them to appear in this way. And since it's a state of mind, why can't they appear that way without the lotto? See, that's why you, that's why theoretical, pardon me? No, see, in, in this game, you can do so much, but it has to be from a particular experience, you see. So, to make up the hypothetical case, uh, you'd get a hypothetical answer and it wouldn't be very insightful.
but um, um, I think I'd rather go back to the daydream and dream interaction of the daydream and dream. Um, There's so much I can say about dreams um, that I have to reduce now, but uh, my work with dreams has shown the following thing in, in every case I have studied dreams. And that is that either it's sometimes people only have what I call a snapshot, just perhaps just one scene and nothing else taking place. But dreams are holographic, so it doesn't make any difference. You can still explore them. And you do it exactly in the same way. All right? That is, in every particular episode, there is some scene that, that can be described. There's a state of mind that the person is in. There is some action that is going on. Three things. If it's in a dream, it is most likely has many particular scenes like that. And they tend to be connected together. They tend to be connected together because there's a particular kind of meaning that's going through them. If the meaning, the meaning can only go f as far as the symbols allow it. Therefore, if there's a split, and a dramatic difference in scene, and therefore a different drama unfolding, that's because the dream could only go this far with the symbols chosen to communicate that meaning. Therefore, if there's another and different set of scenes that are following it, the same thing would be true, one, two, three. Now, a person, we're gonna call this, uh, this, this an episode, made up of one, two, three, four, five, right, five particular scenes in this episode. And if it changes dramatically, we're going to call this the first episode and this the second episode. Now, what the way you can see the intelligibility of a dream is, if, let us assume at the moment we have these two episodes. The mind is always going to bring you with a contrast. See, it's making contrasts. And therefore, if a person records their dream, their dreams must be recorded because you want to get as much precision as you possibly can in terms of the dream. And we tend to distort and interpret dreams too wildly if we just allow ourselves to write them down in the morning or just talk about them. Let's assume, therefore, we have a pure case where someone has recorded the particular episodes with the five scenes. Now, in this, there's going to be some drama. Some drama is taking place. Some struggle. Therefore, in this, the person is going to react to that struggle and they're going to be in a particular state of mind. Something is going to be said. Something is going to be said because there's always not just a scene, an action, a state of mind, but there has to be some logos, some words, all right, something intended. Call that the logos. That has to be there. Therefore, the dream is going to pick up this episode as something in our own life that is unfinished. What's unfinished is our pathologos. The daydream represents the extension of our pathologos in a daydream to the degree to which we're allowed to speculate on it. Therefore, a dream gives us the entire episode, and therefore it complements the daydreams. It completes it, since a daydream is always partial. Right? In using the symbols of our own lives, we use the symbols from our own personal life. Each one of these symbols 
right, has personal significance and key ones, if you can look for the key ones, will then, will be able to then trace them back to one's personal past and find pathologous transmission scenes in every case. And therefore, what's astonishing, if you can go the next step and hold this all together, there is something awake in our waking worlds that is so wise that it can see the difficulties we're having, knows the pathologos drama behind us, can understand the difficulties we're having, can represent it at night to us in the most vivid form, so vivid we think it's real, can capture the unfinished, the unfinished drama we're living, the pathologos and, its, and our struggles with it, can represent it in such clear language that it can offer us a key to tracing it back to its early learning so that we can get out of it. Again and again. What that means? That means that there's something awake, like just say right now. Let us assume for the moment you might, someone might have a struggle being here. If they have a struggle being here and it deals with some early pathologos learning that they've received, the odds are very good that in tonight the dream master, that's what I call it, the dream master, whatever it is that presents us with our dreams, will be able to bring that to our attention, use particular things from our past, and give it to us in such vivid form we're going to think it's real and it's going to present us with the unfinished episode of our daydreams. It's going to vividly represent us and give us an opportunity to explore it in terms of our past. It's going to give us the keys for our own development. Therefore, as the daydream is incomplete and partial, so the dream is symbolic and complete. And therefore, it's a dialogue between the daydream, the night dream, and a three-way with our everyday world. So daydream, night, and between it is our day. One, two, three. Magnificent as it is. I was just seeing the beauty of this in that sense that that statement where you come to see that everything that everything around you is so perfect, just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Well, it strikes me that everything you have up there is everything we do. I mean, we have inner dialogues, we have dreams, we have daydreams, we have parents, we have images. I mean, it's like everything we do, we can then use to see ourselves. Dreams take things from our past, which means that everything that happened in our past mm -hmm. is important because it's going to be used in. And it means. To see ourselves. And it means, does it not, that right now there is a wisdom, there is a seeing going on, amazing depth, amazing artistic work, right? amazing information about ourselves can reach into our own backgrounds and pick up things we've forgotten that allow this dream to represent in all of its clarity and with its precision our particular dramas and pathologos and give it to us night after night after night after night. And that means, like right now, there's part of us that's wise, part of us that's uh, <laughs> foolish, part of us in the struggle, and that's our life. Part of us knows everything we need to know. Everything. 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 Yeah. All right, thank you. That's what I wanted to cover this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.